All right. Well, it's great to see so many people coming in and filling our virtual room here. Uh, we got 83 attendees and counting. Um, I think we had over 270 people sign up uh, for this particular webinar on Transition Declares a Climate Emergency uh, with Laura Berry and Rebecca Harris of uh, the Climate Mobilization. Um, my name is Don Hall. I'm with Transition US and I'll be your host for this webinar. Uh, just to tell you a little bit about how it's going to go, I'm going to make a, a few quick announcements here uh, about how to use this platform uh, and mention a few other upcoming events uh, for Transition US that you might be interested in. Uh, then I'll introduce our panelists. Uh, they will be presenting on how to uh, get a climate emergency declared in your local community. Um, we'll have some time for Q&A uh, using the Q&A module uh, of this Zoom platform. Uh, and then uh, there'll be a call to action at the end, uh, moving from uh, education into action. Uh, so very glad to be here with you today. Um, Transition US, for anybody who isn't familiar with us, uh, is a national hub for the International Transition Towns Movement, uh, supporting the growth and health of uh, local communities, local initiatives to build community resilience all over the country in more than 100 locations. Um, and we got two other uh, great events coming up that you might want to consider, put on your calendar now. Um, one is another free webinar with the founder of the Transition Towns Movement, uh, Rob Hopkins, uh, has recently published a new book uh, called From What Is to What If, uh, about the role of imagination in changing the world. Uh, and he's going to be talking to us on February 18th, that's a Tuesday, uh, at the same time, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern. Uh, and I'll put the link in the chat. And I also want to make you aware of our second national gathering uh, that is coming up this summer in Vermont at Castleton University, uh, June 11th to 14th. Um, and building on Rob's book and the power of imagination, which has been strong in the transition movement since the beginning. Uh, our theme is from what is to what if, reimagining and rebuilding our world. Uh, and we've already secured one of our keynote speakers, which is going to be Bill McKibben. Uh, we're also going to be having folks uh, talking about uh, Vermont's Farm to Plate program, uh, which is the most advanced statewide program for local food in the country. Uh, and we're going to have many other great opportunities. Uh, so uh, please do. Uh, note these dates in your calendar and stay tuned to transitionus.org uh, for registration information uh, as well as a call for workshop proposals that's going to be coming out. So, uh, so we're on this Zoom platform uh, and a couple ways that you can uh, interact with us uh, throughout this presentation. Uh, is to use the Q&A module uh, that you'll likely see at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and you can ask questions at any time. Uh, we did get a few advanced questions from participants uh, that I'll share during our Q&A period, but uh, feel free to ask others as they arise. And we'll get to as many as possible. And then you can also um, type into the chat uh, as we go along here and share other resources or thoughts related to the material that's being presented. Uh, this is a place uh, where you can have a little conversation um, during this event. So uh, we welcome that as well. Uh, and so without too much ado here, I uh, want to introduce Laura and Rebecca. And 
Laura Berry brings over a decade of experience in climate advocacy, organizing, and policy to her role as research and publications director at Climate Mobilization. Her previous work with groups, including the Stockholm Environment Institute and 350.org, has spanned international and environmental politics, local climate change planning, and democratic public engagement. She has also published research on the intersections of activism and public engagement and facilitating environmental policy change. Laura now works to research and facilitate the development of emergency speed climate policy and governance frameworks in support of the climate mobilization's vision of a World War II scale climate mobilization. So thanks for being here with us, Laura. Thanks and I also me. want to introduce Rebecca Harris, uh, who is the organizing director of the Climate Mobilization. Uh, she's a dynamic organizer, has been working for social justice since the age of 15, when she became involved in the peace movement in her hometown of Salem, Oregon. Rebecca joined the Climate Mobilization in February 2018, bringing a background in facilitation, fundraising, and strategic communications. Most recently, Rebecca worked as development and communications manager at Latino Union of Chicago, an immigrants and workers' rights organization. So very glad to have you with us as well, Rebecca. And I'll Thanks turn so it over much. to the two of you uh, for your presentation. Really looking forward to it. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Don. It's really an honor to be here and with the folks on the call with the Transition Network. Um, the Climate Mobilization has been a big fan of Transition US and Transition Network for a long time. So um, it's very exciting to get to share some of our work with us. And we're, we're looking forward to um, answering your questions. Um, so please do, um, as Don said, let us know in the chat box or the Q&A um, as we go along uh, if you have any questions and we will do our best to answer them. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, for folks in just a second. Oh. Great, so I'm gonna talk, um, we are gonna talk uh, through this agenda today in our presentation. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, the emergency situation that we face with regards to climate change as well as um, how local governments across the world uh, are already leading in the response to this emergency. And then I'm gonna pass it over to Rebecca, who is gonna talk about um, how you can start a climate emergency campaign um, or a neighborhood group in your own community, um, as well as some details and resources about that, uh, our programming. And then we'll have our Q&A and some closing comments from Don and us. So we'll get started. So, if you are joining this webinar, I know it's pretty unlikely that I need to convince you of um, what we are facing right now, which is we are in a climate emergency. Um, as it stands, we are currently at about 1.1 degrees Celsius of warming above and beyond pre-industrial conditions, and we are already seeing the impacts of climate change of global warming across the world. We, <laughs> if you've been paying attention to the news, you've seen the massive fires and the uh, Australian bush, you've seen the, Australia, the fires from the Amazon last year, you've seen news of flooding, of people being displaced from their homes, of massive storms, of raging hurricanes. Um, you know, millions of people every year are already being impacted by climate change and civil unrest, famine, displacement, and even war are uh, exacerbated by what we are experiencing right now. And this isn't just one degree of warming. We are uh, on track, according to the World Meteorological Organization, to uh, experience a temperature rise of three to five degrees Celsius, which is about four and a half to nine degrees Fahrenheit um, at our current sort of you know, levels of warming and, and at the rate that we are putting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Um, and last year, and I think quite a few of you probably have heard about this, this specific report, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change um, said that we only have a decade to radically transform the economy in order to even have a 50% chance of avoiding the worst impacts of climate change. So this is an emergency situation. We have essentially done what David Wallace Wells uh, talked about in The Uninhabitable Earth. We've brought our planet to climate catastrophe in a single generation, although the, the roots of the emergency would go back much longer, and we have the responsibility to address it as such. Um, so this is our baseline. Uh, we know that the earth is already too hot for safety and justice. We're experiencing the impacts of this climate emergency situation now. 
um, that we face an existential threat to society, to the lives of millions, if not billions of people, um, and we don't have any more time to sort of mess around about this. A gradual approach, the one that we've taken for the past uh, 40 years, as some can argue, it has not saved us and it will not save us moving forward. Um, you know, we are in a moment right now where the climate emergency is putting billions of lives at risk and we need our whole society to respond to this situation. But all of that said, I have some good news. Um, we're finally understanding that this is an existential threat that we're facing and we actually are building the power to rise up and to demand that our communities and our political leaders recognize that we are in a climate emergency and we need to have an emergency response. Uh, 2019 was pretty much a watershed um, sort of moment for the global climate emergency movement, which is this ever-growing group of activists, communities, and politicians who are rejecting this incrementalist change paradigm and are mobilizing uh, across the world to save their homes, to save their communities, um, their families from these planetary impacts of, of climate change and ecological destruction that we're facing. Um, according to Oxford Dictionaries, the use of the term climate emergency actually increased by 10, over 10,000% 10, in 2019. And they named it its world, you know, sort of the word of the year was climate emergency. Um, 11,000 scientists worldwide have united and said, you know, this is a climate emergency and we need massive transformative change in order to address it. You know, this is not a question of scientific consensus anymore. We recognize what the problem is and what we need to do. Um, and what we're gonna talk about a little bit more is how uh, new and existing environmental groups across the United States and across the world have taken on the call to declare a climate emergency in their own communities and to push their governments from the local to the national to the international to recognize this existential threat through declaring a climate emergency and starting to take emergency action. Um, so as of this morning, um, we have uh, over 1,000, actually 1,311 uh, 1, climate emergencies uh, declarations have been passed globally um, in 25 countries. And 73 of those climate emergency declarations have been passed in the United States, uh, including cities, ma major cities like New York um, and Los Angeles, all the way down to my own hometown of Bar Harbor, Maine, a tiny little town of only a couple thousand people. So, you know, and the increase in, in climate emergency declarations, again, in 2019 was explosive. You know, we started the, the year off with only 233 declarations worldwide and ended with over 1,300. So the growth of this movement uh, has uh, significantly increased in the past year, which is really um, inspiring in a lot of ways. And it's not slowing down, uh, at least not that we can tell. So I'm going to talk a little bit about actually what a climate emergency declaration is, because I think there's some confusion sometimes about what this means. And for us at TCM, a, a climate emergency declaration is a tool. It's a piece of legislation or it's a directive that has essentially says that a government or an organization um, is on record in support of taking emergency action to restore a safe climate. Now, what this means is that uh, a local government has recognized the existential nature of climate change, you know, what we talked about at the beginning, um, and has also committed to doing what it can in order to address that existential threat. And that, in uh, an ideal world, means for us reaching zero greenhouse gas emissions as quickly as possible to avoid the, you know, at the most harm uh, possible to communities, because we're already in a climate emergency. We know we are already at risk and we want to minimize that risk. So climate emergency declarations um, ideally are meant to set this goal of as quickly as possible reducing and eliminating greenhouse gas emissions and also to begin safely drawing down carbon dioxide from the atmosphere because we already know the planet is already too hot. We're not at a safe level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And so our goal is not simply to limit the harm, but we want to reverse the harm. We want to restore a safe climate and have, you know, that we don't want to just, yeah, put a band-aid on the problem essentially. So the declaration is a statement. It's a tool for local organizers and local communities to say our governments have committed to this and we're going to figure out a way to get there together as a community. So <clears throat> One of the biggest questions is what does passing this declaration actually do? Um, but all governments, all of us, all individuals, our you know, community groups, churches, schools, we have the power to begin mobilizing in the face of the climate emergency. 
um, because a climate emergency requires an emergency response, you know, something different than what we've been doing so far and so in, in what, how we are addressing climate change, how we're taking action um, from, you know, the individual level up to the government level. So acknowledging the truth of the existential threat um, is really critical actually from a psychological perspective. That, um, and passing a local climate emergency declaration is the first step towards that. Um, so once we have that, and especially given that at the moment we have very limited federal leadership on climate change, um, local governments are a place where we can actually engage and push towards uh, significant action in a way that we haven't before. So the way that we talk about this, at least, uh, you know, is about shifting into emergency mode uh, on the climate emergency, because right now, we are working in normal mode, which is what um, our founder, Dr. Margaret Klein Salomon, talks about insofar as um, the differences between how groups function when they don't have something, you know, an existential threat or an immediate uh, impact, you know, sort of looming over them versus emergency mode when all of the resources that they have um, are, are dedicated towards solving this crisis. So this chart here is, is in Margaret Klein Salomon's paper, Leading the Public into Emergency Mode, in which she describes the differences between how normally just me sitting here in normal mode, I am, you know, sort of balancing my priorities. I might be a little bit thirsty, so I'll get some water after this. I'm focused on a number of things. Um, whereas in an emergency, if this building that I'm sitting in was on fire, my top priority would be getting people out of the building, getting myself out of the building and dealing with the problem at hand. And so emergency mode happens when an individual faces an existential threat. And right now, climate change, the climate emergency is that existential threat. And we have to refocus all of our attention from the individual level all the way up to governments at the national level to address this problem because it's, it's what we have to do in the face of, of the impacts that we're facing. <clears throat> I am actually a little bit thirsty. So when it comes to what we discuss, uh, when, when we think about the big picture and we think about everyone shifting into emergency mode, this is what climate mobilization means. We have to, as a nation, as a world, shift into emergency mode and to basically you know, change the way that our economy and society is working towards an equitable, zero emissions, regenerative economy that we need to protect people um, and, to, and species, the, you know, the species that we share this planet with. And you know, I can talk a little bit about maybe in the Q&A, the sort of historic context of this and how the United States entered emergency mode and mobilized during World War II and how social movements um, have, you know, plenty of examples of people in emergency mode. But this, you know, this webinar is focused specifically on local governments. So I want to talk a little bit about how we see local action as we're, you know, building up to this ultimate goal of climate mobilization of this major society and economy wide shift that we that we need. Um, that really is the rational, the only rational response left to the ex existential risk of climate change. <clears throat> so why focus on local communities uh, when we are talking about this big, you know, national, international need to mobilize? So since 2016, the vast majority of the climate emergency declarations that have passed have passed at local levels of government. Only nine countries and the United K or the nine countries and the European Union have passed sort of national or supranational uh, climate emergency declarations. Um, and that's because people, generally speaking, have more access and trust more uh, their local officials uh, and local community leaders um, when it comes to actually making change and seeing an impact with regards to, to um, activism and, and pushing for that. So local governments, town councils, uh, county boards of commissioners generally don't have the same budgetary or legal um, regulatory powers as obviously higher levels of government do. However, um, you know, our approach to this depends on the fact that uh, there are government champions and activists who recognize that this is an existential threat and that they are going to do everything that they can, uh, even if they alone can't reduce their greenhouse gas emissions to zero uh, at emergency speed, they know that they can set stronger targets. Uh, they can set the framework. They can say, we're going to try to do this and we're going to do it as quickly as possible as, you know, as much as we can. Um, they can, so working downwards essentially. 
they can work upwards, they can actually act as advocates, um, publicly advocating for an emergency response from multiple levels of government. So a small town like the one that I live in um, can advocate publicly for the state of Maine and the national government to have an emergency response on climate change to actually provide funding and resources for us at the local level to adapt. And then outwards, you know, the climate emergency is going to take everyone and engaging everyone will require you know, sort of businesses, uh, individuals, communities, everyone to actually understand the threat that we face to be in emergency mode. And so local governments can take a, a role in actually building that uh, understanding culturally and also to building power to actually fight for the end goal of mobilization um, that we need. So I wanna take just a second to talk a little bit about what a climate emergency response isn't, um, since I think a lot of people after climate emergency declarations are passed are curious as to what happens next. Um, and you know, at a local level, a, an emergency response program, uh, some of which I'll talk about afterward, after this slide, will of course likely include policies on things like renewable energy, on um, energy efficiency, land use, transportation, you know, the sort of the typical things that we talk about with regards to climate change and sustainability. Um, it, those will inevitably look different from community to community. So in, again, in my town, heating during the winter is a huge source of greenhouse gas emissions, but that might, might not be the same for a town in California or a town in Iowa. And so essentially, when we talk about a, forming a climate emergency program at the local level, we have to set some boundaries. Um, one of which is, <clears throat> you know, we have to recognize that as quickly as possible, reducing and eliminating greenhouse gas emissions has to be the goal and the baseline by which we take our actions and why, by, why, by which governments take action. So um, similarly, we have to recognize that incrementalist policies that may have worked possibly you know, a couple decades ago are, are not going to be the solution at this moment, at least not alone. Um, and similarly, individual behavior, um, such as re you know, recycling or, or going vegan, these are incredibly important things, but they aren't an emergency response. This isn't the whole sort of package of what we need to be doing. And similarly, um, community climate action programs, which are amazing and wonderful, but might not have the impact that we actually need in terms of emergency rapid speed action. Again, these are important things, but they're, they're not what we're talking about with regards to the scale and the speed and the scope of action that we need to take. Because when the goal is to provide maximum protection for people, we have to actually act like it's an emergency. So um, this is a comic from the Australian bushfires where you know, we have needs right now, our communities are suffering from the impacts of climate change and we can't push off these you know, very real realities until 20, whenever. Um, we have to act now. And so um, it's incredibly important to, to act within the context of the national global mobilization effort when we're talking about local policy. So I know I have relatively little time left, so I'm only going to co cover a couple, of, a couple of local programs. But um, so in the United States, you know, we haven't had a lot of time between most of the climate emergency declarations that were passed and now. Um, it's really the vast majority of them were passed only in the last year. So many local governments and many local climate emergency groups are actually working in the process of developing these emergency programs uh, as we speak. But I can speak to a couple of ones that, that are already existing. Um, so in July of 2019, uh, Los Angeles, which was one of the first sort of big climate emergency groups and campaigns that TCM has worked with, um, made history through establishing the world's first ever office of the climate mobilization, a uh, climate emergency mobilization director. So this was a pretty much a, a new government office in the city, funded with a million dollars of seed funding and um, you know support to with the explicit goal of a rapid mobilization to achieve zero emissions, carbon neutral, regenerative, egalitarian economy with the principles of a just transition um, as an actual government policy, which is fantastic and was the result of months of local organizing from a local uh, environmental justice coalition called Leap LA and also includes um, you know, goals for getting obviously to zero emissions, but also working with community assemblies and uh, marginalized communities across the city to ensure that community engagement was a core part of this mobilization process. So this is an example of 
what I'm talking about when we talk about climate emergency mode. It is about shifting resources. It's about shifting, um, you know, government operations, the ways in which we think about democracy um, towards addressing this problem. Because the government of, you know, the LA City Council didn't know how to mobilize, but they needed to put resources, they needed to talk to people who were going to be impacted by climate change to understand what this emergency mobilization was going to look like. Um, just going to mention this, Berkeley, California um, is another example. This is one specific policy, and I know that I spoke about the need to not focus on specific policies, but it's pretty significant. Um, after they declared a climate emergency, Berkeley, California has been, and, and other cities across California have been investigating how to actually respond to the climate emergency with, with policy. And one thing that happened was um, a natural gas ban, essentially a de facto ban in new residential buildings, um, which is really significant because 25% of greenhouse gas emissions in California comes from buildings. Um, so this is one step towards the kind of emergency action, you know, outright banning fossil fuels is something that more and more cities are exploring in response to the climate emergency. Um, and 13 other cities now in California have actually followed suit and done the same. So again, it's about expanding the impact of, of these actions and, and you know, publicly advocating for, for other cities to follow. Um, I'm gonna skip Durban. Durban was the very first place in the world to declare a climate emergency and they have a fundamental, you know, a fantastic climate emergency plan. Um, I will send the link in the chat afterwards um, to folks to read through their plan, but essentially it covers um, emergency speed, decarbonization, drawing down carbon emissions, um, and an immense, you know, sort of outreach and advocacy program that this city, the small city of Durban, in Australia, which is currently on fire, is working on to uh, to declare a, to to declare a climate emergency, which they've already done, and then act like it similarly. And then the last thing, um, again, read about it. It's really interesting. In Oxford, uh, in the United Kingdom, we had um, a really incredible response after um, the city declared a climate emergency and actually created a citizens assembly, um, a representative body to, of, of local citizens to deliberate on the climate emergency and come up with recommendations. And they not only recommended that the city go faster than what the UK government was doing, and so far as saying we needed to be, they want to be carbon neutral by this year, um, and then also led to a 19 million pound investment um, towards energy efficiency, cutting transport emissions, um, increasing renewable energy, you know, an entire package, not just one specific policy. So this is a really another great example um, of sort of looking at here's how cities are, are shifting into emergency mode. Um, we're not quite there yet, obviously, in the United States, but, but this is what we've been working on. So thank you very much. I'm sorry I'm a little over time, um, but I'm going to pass it off to Rebecca now. Um, and please send any questions in the Q&A. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Laura. Um, so I'm going to be talking a bit about concretely what it is we can do to build the climate emergency movement in our neighborhoods, um, in our towns, in our counties. Um, and in the organizations that we're part of and are working with. So first, I just wanna take a bit of a step back, right? Um, we have a lot of great victories, a lot of great success stories that Laura has just shared. Um, and we also wanna be clear though, that there's immense vested interest backing the current system and that the changes we need to create are gonna impact everyone and every facet of our lives, every business, every kitchen, every home, every school, everyone. And these changes are gonna cost a lot of money. They're gonna take a lot of resources, a lot of effort to create, and they could greatly shift who profits. And because of that, there are already people who are trying to sacrifice our survival for their short-term gain. But we also know that there's millions of people, just like everyone on this webinar, who's looking for the change that we can create. And there's actually a recent poll that came out that showed that 56% of all registered voters, or at least 82 million Americans, actually believe that climate change is an emergency. They agree with us. And they want to protect their families, their neighborhoods, and their communities from the climate emergency, just like all of us on this webinar want to do as well. 
And so we are working to grow the movement in our neighborhoods, in our cities, in our counties, through local climate emergency campaigns and through neighborhood climate emergency groups. Um, so I'm gonna be sharing a bit more about some of the ways that you can get involved in, a, in just a couple minutes. Um, we are currently working with local climate emergency campaigns in about 90 cities across the US and Canada. Um, of those, most of them, about 85, are in the United States. Um, and we work with climate groups, we work with individuals who started these campaigns, um, with faith groups that have started these campaigns. Um, and we've seen that number um, double just in the last several months. So this is something that's uh, growing, that's on the upswell, um, and that we're really excited about sharing with all of you so that you have the opportunity to consider uh, potentially joining this movement as well. Our strategy um, for making an impact and building towards the emergency climate mobilization that we wanna create is to make the climate emergency the central issue of the 2020 election by continuing to grow climate emergency campaigns this year and also working to confront candidates for elected office and push them to respond to the emergency. We're also demanding action from local governments, um, just like Laura just talked about. We're working as a movement to strengthen the mass climate strikes planned for this year and next, and working to reach and unite with the 82 million Americans who agree with us so that we can build a large, powerful movement. So I'm gonna talk a little bit now about how you can take action in your community um, through a climate emergency campaign. And uh, for those of you on computers, this is a photo of a climate emergency campaign, I believe in Rochester, Minnesota. We believe that in this moment, we need everyone to build a large and powerful movement. So we're making it easy for you with a number of resources that we're going to share um, after this call. Um, and for those of you listening in on Facebook Live or listening in on the radio, we are going to share a little bit later on a sign up link that you can use um, to sign up and get information um, and, and resources on starting a local climate emergency campaign. So we have created a timeline that spells out step by step as an easy recipe you can follow to get a climate emergency push started in your community, um, leading to passing a climate emergency declaration and then to getting your community to launch a climate emergency program. And we'll be talking through some of the first couple steps that you can do to get a climate emergency push started in your community, starting with getting ready, um, then reaching out to partner organizations, talking to other groups in your community about a climate emergency effort. And then um, a tool, tool we're gonna share with you called the Climate Emergency Response Training, which is an educational workshop that we're releasing to all of you that you can put on for others in your community in order to orient them and bring them on board with this work. So first, uh, step of starting a climate emergency campaign is to find people to work with. Um, we suggest um, finding an organization you're already involved in um, to start a climate emergency push. Um, this could be a local transition group you're already part of, it could be a climate group you're part of, or it could be another group in your community you know that wants to take it on. Um, if none of those groups come to mind, you could even work with a group of friends or a faith community to start a climate emergency campaign. Then we really suggest as part of starting your climate emergency push, getting in touch with other organizations in your community. Um, these could be other climate groups, um, environmental justice organizations in your area, indigenous tribal governments, um, these organizations could be neighborhood groups, uh, parent groups, student groups, um, really any type of organization where people come together and where you can make contact and begin a, a conversation around the climate emergency um, and whether joining a climate emergency campaign might mesh 
um, with some of these other organizations goals. We have found that across the board, the strongest climate emergency campaigns that are able to make the biggest impact with their local governments are those that bring together several different organizations. Um, and they're even more powerful when they bring together many different types of, of organizations in the community. And we recommend opening a conversation about the climate emergency through something that's called a one-on-one -on -one that might be familiar to those of you who've done other community organizing work, right? So this is basically a coffee meeting, um, short, 30, 45 minutes, talking with someone that you know or an acquaintance um, or a friend of a friend, really working to build a relationship and get a sense of how they see themselves what their story is um, and assuming it's someone from an organization you're trying to engage also getting a sense of what that organization's work is what their goals are what their priorities are um, and what they are trying to accomplish in the context of a climate emergency campaign you can frame it as asking for advice or getting their thoughts on your work um, getting their opinion on something Right, but really you're listening to them first and then only talking second, right? In one of these meetings to build a strong relationship, we wanna listen about 80% of the time and talk just about 20% of the time. And in a one-on-one -on -one meeting, um, really can, want to ask open-ended questions, um, getting to know them, give them a chance to really talk about themselves and their work, um, and then really think about what could their role be in a climate emergency push? How might it line up with what they're trying to accomplish? How might it um, help them meet their goals as an individual or their goals with the organization that they work with? Um, and then, Although this is not a time to um, talk at length about a campaign, we want to move them towards some type of a next step, whether asking for a second meeting to talk about more nuts and bolts or uh, straight up asking them if they would join the campaign um, or just asking them who else you should talk to and who else um, you should be in conversation with. So, this is the, after, the first step after you have um, found, thought through who is running the climate emergency campaign is really to um, start conversations with other organizations in your area and begin opening a dialogue about what a climate emergency response might look like in your community. And after that, we really encourage people to start reaching out to other individuals in their community um through what we call climate emergency response trainings so this is a short workshop that immediately puts people to work on a climate emergency campaign and we're going to be releasing this curriculum to all of you after today's webinar it's completely scripted out for you um, as part of our organizing guide um, it can ideally be held every two to four weeks to bring in a new group of people to learn about the climate emergency and take action um, and it's set up so that it fills its own seats. There's time in the workshop for the people who are there to actually um, list out who they want to invite to the next workshop. So we think this is a great community building and education tool around the climate emergency that we would like to share with all of you. And we're also available for follow-up questions if any of you wanna talk more about what putting this on might look like in your area. I'm gonna talk a little bit now about another option for starting a climate emergency push in your community. Um, and this is um, around starting block-based or neighborhood-based groups. So we know that many different movements and organizations organize themselves um, using small groups. And if folks could chime in in the chat, um, what are some of the other movements and organizations that we see around us using small groups uh, to organize themselves? And make sure to um, send it to all panelists and attendees so everybody can see. 
Great, thanks y'all. Um, so schools use small groups. Um, so we also have seen um, the global justice movement organize itself very powerfully using affinity groups, um, Extinction Rebellion and many other groups um, organized using small groups to build a large powerful movement. Um, neighborhood watches, um, thanks for, for that note, uh, Dodi. Um, and we also have seen many other movements um, from evangelical Christian churches to um, household workers movements, workers rights movements, organize large powerful uh, presences using small groups. Um, we have a couple other folks chiming in, 350 Mass uses nodes to organize Mothers Out Front, does faith-based groups, um, block parties, groups fighting eminent domain threats, um, all of these are movements that have grown strong and powerful using the power of small groups. And so we are now um, calling on folks who, you know, would like to get something started in their community and maybe don't have the time or energy to start a full climate emergency campaign to begin organizing um, in their neighborhoods, uh, right, as a way to build stronger relationships as a way to create involvement for people who have less time to participate, um, and as a way to help us weave together a stronger movement. Um, and so we have a curriculum we're gonna be sharing for neighborhood groups to use as well with folks on this call, with folks who want to sign up to take action. Um, and this curriculum has three key pieces to it, um, growth, community, and action. Um, and so we have um, a host of ideas for neighborhood groups to take on um, centered around these three pieces, right? So neighborhood groups can work to grow the movement by engaging and recruiting more people. They can work to do outreach to organizations like we just talked about, or they can hold climate emergency response trainings in order to grow the climate emergency movement. Um, neighborhood groups can also hold social events, hold educational events with call to action. Um, I'm really excited to share as well that we are going to be releasing new tools around climate grief support groups. Um, and we see that as a great avenue for neighborhood climate emergency groups um, to explore as well. And some of those tools are going to be um, coming out in conjunction with our executive director, Margaret Klein Salomon's new book. Um, facing the climate emergency, transform yourself with the power of climate truth. And that book is gonna be coming out, I believe in, in early April and we'll be releasing the tools then or shortly after. So all of these resources um, that I mentioned are climate emergency campaign guide, our um, climate emergency response training curriculum and our guide to starting a neighborhood group. You can access all of these by signing up at tinyurl.com slash transition climate emergency. Again, that's tinyurl.com slash transition climate emergency. And I believe Don has put or will momentarily put that hyperlink um, in the chat so that all of you can access it. Um, and so we'll send you then a guide to starting a climate emergency campaign. We'll send you a guide to starting a neighborhood climate emergency group, as well as a recording of this call. So now we have some time set aside for Q&A. Um, so Dawn, would you like to get us started with some of the questions? Uh, yeah, happy to. I uh, just put the link in the chat for um, sending up, giving your information if you're interested in learning more about starting a climate emergency campaign or a neighborhood group. Uh, so please do click on that. Um, we got a few questions in advance from participants, so i like to start with those. Um, the first question is about uh, why so many people resist change. Um, would the lifestyle changes be so hard, uh, required to uh, address the climate emergency, or is it too late? 
Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, our executive director, Margaret Klein-Salomon, has done a lot of work on this topic of why people resist change or why people don't understand that we're in an emergency. Um, she's talked about something called pluralistic ignorance, um, which is psychological research that actually shows that if you're around people who are not acting like it's an emergency, um, you are not going to act like it's an emergency. You're going to not understand the seriousness of the problem and you're not going to act accordingly. And so this is why we think this piece of naming this as an emergency is so key. Um, and getting our governments, getting our society into emergency mode. So that's a lot of what our work centers around is creating an environment that's conducive for people to understand and act accordingly. Great. Do you want to add anything to that, Laura? No, I think, I think Rebecca captured it pretty well with regards to, to emergency action, because again, you know, getting into an emergency, getting into emergency mode is something that is a very personal process on, on climate change. I think many people on this call are, have been concerned about environmental issues for a long time. I mean, I, both Rebecca and I have worked on, on climate change since we were teenagers and have found that this sort of emergency framing is, is something that is incredibly compelling and, and drives us to do the work that we do. And so I think when it comes to local action, um, you know, it is, it does go beyond just sort of recycling or encouraging people to eat less meat but really is about saying okay my you know my life's work is about uh, doing what i can as an individual to address this problem and that oftentimes means working in i mean that does mean working in collaboration with everyone else so you know when it comes to what's going to be difficult about the climate emergency um, is is dealing with the massive societal changes that are going to be uh, required, but um, that also comes with massive potential for us to build a better society together, um, which is also incredibly exciting. So I, I've found that when I talk to people about climate change, um, it's much better to talk about the potential for how the world could be better than actually the, the sort of the sacrifices that we have to make, because we will have to make sacrifices, but there's a point, and the point is to have a world where everyone um, can be happy and healthy and have a safe climate. So um, I think it is quite, you know, it's important how we talk about it and learning from the sort of so social psychology of, of behavioral change and societal change and social movements um, is, is really helpful in that. Great. Thank you. That was a great addition. Uh, so that was a very big picture question. Uh, this is more a technical question. Uh, would a climate emergency declaration protect a town from legal action by developers or others who might feel like their interests are harmed by this? That is a really interesting question. Um, and it does have to do with sort of the, the legal jurisdiction of, of a specific municipality. Um, you know, one of the issues that we face in the United States is actually kind of a kneecapping of local democracy when it comes to what towns can actually do um, with regards to limiting greenhouse gas emissions and making making choices, making local democratic choices about the kind of town that, that they want to build and to have. So with regards to local developers, we haven't experienced that yet with the, the climate emergency resolution. We actually have, um, for example, in the Berkeley example that I talked about and in California, we've experienced, um, you know, using the resolution not as the legal sort of mandate or the legal um, sort of, uh, you know, ability to take further action, but as sort of a, a, a baseline upon which new regulatory structures and new um, legislation is being passed. And so it's not necessarily that the emergency declaration grants new or specific legal uh, powers or ability to towns to do something, but it does give local organizer and act and organizers and activists something to say, you know, this is an emergency. You've recognized this formally as the body, you know, as a governmental body. And so we need to do as much as possible. Um, so in Berkeley, like the example with the, the, um, natural gas ban, that was something that was questionable as to whether or not the cities had the, the legal jurisdiction to go ahead and, and make that call. And so far, they basically were changing um, zoning, reg not zoning regulations, but public safety building codes to prevent the installation of natural gas. And it was a question, actually, as to whether the state regulatory agency was going to allow that to happen. But um, because local 
authorities have um, basically regulatory ability over public health and public safety, it was something that they were able to do. So it's going to depend, honestly, on local regulation and local statute and state you know, statute about what's going to be possible in a climate emergency response. But again, you know, this was something that they hadn't done before, that they hadn't investigated whether they could do before. And as a result of the climate emergency declaration and that sort of need to find new and creative ways to address greenhouse gas emissions that the city and now multiple cities across California are, are doing something really significant on, on fossil, limiting fossil fuel infrastructure and use. Okay, well, we've got a lot of questions here, so I'm gonna keep firing them out. Um, this one I think is about um, how do we ensure that the steps that are taken as a result of climate emergency plans are holistic solutions that don't have um, serious negative uh, unintended consequences. Uh, one person wrote, I have studies showing the extraordinary energy and conflict minerals embodied in manufacturing solar panels and wind turbines. Um, do you know anyone doing due diligence evaluations on renewables? That is a difficult one because when we talk about transition and when we talk about a renewable energy future um you know many many studies have shown sort of the inevitable consequence of if we were to replace every single kilowatt hour or joules worth of energy with regards to um you know the energy that we use right now in the society that we use right now in the economy that we have um, it would take an immense amount of material resources to make that happen. And so the question and the way that TCM approaches our vision of mobilization has actually to do with massively decreasing um, our energy use as a, as a society and our material use as a society. So because we, we recognize that risk and we recognize um, that we, we need a system that is not built upon extractive industry um, that harms both communities and the planet. So um, off the top of my head, I, I actually don't have um, specific resources about conflict minerals and, and the use of, of um, you know, rare earth minerals in, in renewable energy systems, but I do know at the very least, um, since in the inevitability is that we do use energy as a society, and even if we massively decrease that energy use, that there's still going to be need to be solar panels and wind turbines and all of these zero uh, emissions sources of energy and electricity in order to provide a good life for people. So I will actually, I will look into it. And so far as specific, um, specific reports that are, are useful, I do know that there are organizations that are taking this very seriously. Um, but again, I mean, the, the, bigger, the bigger question is about, you know, how do we ensure a just transition for people? And that includes um, the people who are working to provide us with the resources that we need to transition off of, renew or off of fossil fuels, but also for the people who right now are working in, um, in the fossil fuel industry and are already uh, can help, you know, suffering as a result of dirty energy and dirty energy extraction, which we know we need to get off of. So in some ways, we know we need to keep extracting resources, um, but there are ways to do it in a way that is more sustainable and, and better. Um, and hopefully with the end goal of not continuing to do it, you know, building, um, building a more sustainable energy system. Wow, so thank you all for all your great questions. I don't know if we're gonna have time to get to every single one of them here, um, but uh, try to combine some that are, that are similar. Um, there was a question about, um, you know, it's disappeared from here, uh, but- uh, If it disappeared, I answered it over time. Okay, yeah. great. Okay, so uh, do, you, do you have a list of current groups uh, that have already created, and I assume this is that have created climate emergency declarations? Yeah, you know, there is actually a um, list of declarations that have been passed worldwide that I'm going to get. Uh, get the link to the page with that list um, shortly and put it in the chat box. Um, in terms of the campaigns we work with in the U.S., we don't we don't have a list publicly. But if you 
sign up through the form if you're interested in potentially starting something. Um, we will connect to you if there is a group in your area. Uh, there were also a few questions around uh, other organizations potentially to collaborate with. Are there any that you're working on the national with on the national level, maybe Drawdown, Sierra Club, Food and Water Watch, um, or there are there other uh, large environmental organizations that have been joining in the climate emergency effort? Yeah, on the National Climate Emergency Declaration Campaign, which you can find online at climateemergency.us, um, Don, if there's any way you could put that link in the chat, that would be great. That's climateemergency.us. Um, there's a number of groups that have partnered with us on that campaign, um, including Poor People's Economic Human Rights Campaign, Progressive Democrats of America, Food and Water Action, which is the 501c4 affiliate of uh, Food and Water Watch, um, Mothers Out Front um, is a partner organization as well. Um, in addition to many other groups that are working to pass a climate emergency declaration through Congress. Um, and we're thrilled to announce that currently there is 91 co-sponsors in the House and about nine in the Senate, including most of the presidential candidates in the Senate. Um, so we're making, uh, we are making a impact through that work. Um, and then in terms of other organizations, we also work with chapters of many other groups that are running climate emergency campaigns using our tools. Um, so it's not just climate mobilization chapters running these campaigns. Um, in some cases, there are local 350 groups, Sunrise chapters, there are Extinction Rebellion chapters running climate emergency campaigns. And we're hoping that after today, uh, there may be transition chapters uh, transition groups running these campaigns as well. That would be great. That's what we want to see. Um, I forgot to mention Elders Climate Action. We're partnering with them as well for their members and their chapters to start climate emergency campaigns. Uh, another couple of real practical questions here. Uh, Andrew asks, is there a way to connect with others in starting a climate emergency campaign in my local area? How to find other people who are interested in this, perhaps through your, your platform? Yeah, so if, if you sign up on the link that was mentioned, tinyurl.com slash transition climate emergency, um, we will follow up with you around next steps. And if there's not already a group in your area, if you're looking to start something, um, we can actually reach out to folks on the, the climate mobilizations list to see if any of those folks would be interested in, uh, in joining with you. Um, of course, it is easier if you can work with an existing group as well, um, but we are also happy to push out new climate emergency campaigns to our email and text list and see who in your area might be interested in joining. All right, um, and we had one here from Ken. I think that just disappeared as well. That was about a question about um, including the an example of a climate emergency declaration that had passed um, mm -hmm. in the United States uh, with the materials, which yes, we will find a couple of examples as well as uh, TCM provides a template resolution for climate emergency organizers um, to get started and to, to, to tailor to their own individual town or municipality um, that is within the organizing materials that we're going to send out. Great. Great. Thank you. Um, Caroline asks, uh, could you talk more about the citizens groups or councils that form with their local governments after a climate emergency has been declared? These, I understand, move the declarations into action. Some examples of these actions would also be appreciated. How are these groups or councils organized with working groups focused on various topics? Sure, I can take this one. Um, right, so you know, I think there are, there's a couple of different sort of options after a um, a climate emergency declaration is passed to actually then bring the town sort of closer to emergency mode action itself. 
Um, the example that I gave in Oxford in the United Kingdom um, is an example of a, a citizens assembly, which is a representative group of local citizens that are tasked with learning about uh, the climate emergency and potential solutions that the city um, could take, uh, you know, potential actions that they could take, and they deliberate on these potential solutions and vote, come up with essentially a, um, a plan or a series of recommendations for the town. So that's one example of community, you know, sort of community engagement through forming a new, uh, a new group to essentially dedicated towards solving at least, or, you know, coming up with this emergency plan at the local level. Um, for other cities, uh, you know, the, the, an ex a good example in the United States at a smaller level than Los Angeles was um, New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, they, as part of their climate emergency declaration, set up a climate emergency task force, which again is, is sort of a mix of government officials and local citizens that are working to come up with and identify the most, um, you know, the, the most effective emergency speed sort of actions towards decreasing greenhouse gas emissions, rolling out renewable energy, working with citizens, um, you know, increasing biodiversity and green space, you know, all of these intersecting issues um, for their town specifically. So there are a number of different sort of formats in which, um, you know, towns can essentially create what I like to think of as the institutional structure for a climate emergency response. And in Los Angeles, that looks like a, um, a massive department, a major department within the town or the city council itself, and then also programs uh, underneath that. But at the very small level, that might just look like a, you know, a task force, and maybe hiring um, you know, some support consultant, et cetera, um, in order to get them to that goal. So what we really want to focus on though is, is you know, encouraging citizen engagement in this process, which we see is incredibly important. There was a question about how do you make this fundamentally, you know, a, both an emergency speed program and, and a democratic one. And I think that that, um, at least for us, is, is really about using this emergency response and using the climate emergency declaration uh, as the reason for actually talking to constituents and talking to citizens about they, what they need in you know in the face of climate change and what they think is is going to be the most effective way to protect their communities and to work together to get to where we need to be which is zero greenhouse gas emissions so citizens assemblies are huge um in you know sort of in the united kingdom and in europe it's something that is um increasing in support and sort of uh popularity in the united states as a way to do this sort of both at once you know engage with people and understand what they're facing and what their fears are and what they think the solutions are. <clears throat> and then also to create a really series of, a, a series of concrete recommendations on how we get to zero emissions very quickly, um, but then local governments um, you know, move forward from there. So I agree, it, it definitely is important um, after a climate emergency declaration to have some sort of structure institutionally at the local government level to, to carry out that work. Um, afterwards that you can't just pass a declaration and you know sort of say okay we passed a declaration that's it um, so yes that's a that was a great question from both people and thank you for letting me squish them together all right and maybe uh, one more here um, there was a question about uh, what is what is the definition of getting to 100 uh, you might have answered that in tax, but is it just um, shifting the town's electricity usage? Or are we thinking about uh, all aspects of energy consumption, including transportation? Sure. Um, when we talk about 100% or zero, rather, we talk about zero you know, rather than 100%, we talk about zero greenhouse gas emissions. And we mean that we don't mean net zero, we don't mean, um, you, know, cl you know, clean econ energy economy or anything else. What we recognize is that every single molecule of carbon dioxide that we put into the atmosphere is adding to the massive risk of this problem. And so we recognize the scale and the scope and the challenges and the difficulties of massively overhauling our energy system, which is only about 71% of our greenhouse gas emissions nationwide. We recognize that this is a really difficult problem you know, to, to be facing. It is the problem to be facing. But we also recognize the need to not beat around the bush when it comes to what we are actually aiming for here as a society. 
Um, and so zero greenhouse gas emissions as a target and by 2030, but really as quickly as possible. We, need, we needed zero greenhouse gas emissions to begin with, you know. So um, by using that language and by using that framing and not just talking about the component parts, which of course we need 100% renewable energy system. We need, um, you know, zero carbon manufacturing. We need zero carbon transportation. All of these things are incredibly important. But by talking about the actual goal, which is to not have, you know, mostly carbon uh, free economy, and then we offset the rest of it because we planted some trees. But really saying, what would it look like to envision a zero carbon world? Um, that gives us the opportunity to number one, hold ourselves accountable to really, really strong, very fast climate action and not just sort of allow ourselves to say, oh, well, we can do this and it's mostly fine. Um, and secondly, it allows us to actually envision that world. It gives us the framework where we can say, what does the, what does the world post-transition look like if we're actually aiming for zero greenhouse gas emissions? What does that mean? What does that actually you know, mean that we have to do, that we have to do as a society and as a world? So I'm all for talking about 100% renewable energy. I'm talking, I'm, I'm, you know, when, when these terms mean something, I think it's important. But, um, you know, yes, I think that saying, as a town, we are committing to doing everything we can to get to zero greenhouse gas emissions is an incredibly important step, even if you know that you probably aren't going to get there, because you're taking that stance publicly and taking that stance as a campaign and saying to others, to other groups, to other governments, to the world, this is where we need to be. And we're taking, you know, we're, we're taking the chance at, at saying this publicly and actually trying, and you need to join us too so that we can get there. And even if we only get 70% of the way, that's still better than where we are right now. So that's my feelings on, on the, the language of 100% versus zero. Um, Rebecca, if you have any other thoughts, I'm happy to, yeah, to give you the floor, but. Yeah, thanks, Laura. I'd like to actually just quickly, before we wrap up, um, take a couple of the other questions folks had. There was a question around inserting a climate emergency message into political campaigns. Um, both nationally and locally. We're, we've been really excited to actually see um, the Bernie Sanders campaign, as well as a couple other presidential campaigns, pick up the messaging of climate change being an emergency. Um, and we think that we can do that with local campaigns as well, with campaigns for Congress um, as well. Um, somebody was mentioning in particular the Democratic primary for city council in Washington, D.C. Um, thanks for that question, David. Um, so, you know, you can reach out to and build relationships with candidates in that primary, one or more candidates, and ask them to really bring this issue front and center. You can ask them to join in climate with climate emergency actions uh, to start showing up and themselves um, advertising that to the media. That's one way that you could get them to potentially take this, uh, this message on. Um, you can also, you know, work with folks that are planning candidate forums, debates, other events. Um, try to get them to insert the messaging into those events. And then, of course, the other way we can put this message into action during campaign season is by bird dogging candidates, confronting them, uh, demanding that they answer the tough questions about how we can really respond to the emergency. Um, so those are some of the strategies that we're using um, and that we think would be great for you to use as well. Um, Andrew, thanks for the question about individual behaviors as well. Um, if a whole community adopts those behaviors, that would be great. Those are the types of change we need. We believe that we're not, we are not likely to get a whole community adopting the behaviors we need unless we have that message coming through the government, through the media, right? Not just from our um, climate organizations. And so that's why we're really working to shift all of society into emergency mode is because that's where we think we can get the impact from, from behavior change is when we have public service announcements around it, when we have those changes actually being supported by policy changes um, that make it easier for people to live without flying, right? Not just from, from our individual um, behaviors. Um, one more quick question. I see a question on rural 
and conservative areas passing climate emergency declarations. We've seen an explosion in the last few months of lots of climate emergency campaigns um, in more rural areas and more conservative areas um, and in more red states and swing states. Um, there are versions of the declaration that have been created for those uh, areas. And um, Hendrika, if you'd like to put your email address in the chat box just for panelists um, and send it to us, we will follow up with those resources for you individually. Um, so with that, I'd like to move us along to just talking through your next steps um, and your takeaways. I would ask us all um, to share in the chat box to panelists and attendees, um, what is your next step in putting what we have talked about today into action? Um, and if you need anything else to start, any other resources besides what we've already said we're sending out, what else do you feel like you need to get started? Um, so if folks could send the answer to those questions to all panelists and attendees, uh, that would be great. And just a reminder, um, I'm gonna also put in the chat box um, the sign up form. On url.com slash transition climate emergency. Um, and that is the link that you can go to uh, to sign up and uh, make sure that we have your information uh, to follow up with um, around next steps with a climate emergency campaign or a neighborhood based group. Um, so as folks um, add in their takeaways, um, as folks add in um, commitments around what their next step is um, to the chat box, um, I am going to turn it over uh, to Don for some closing remarks. Great, well, uh, thank you for the excellent presentation. Uh, I know that this issue of declaring climate emergencies is tied to so many large topics uh, that I uh, appreciate everybody's patience. Uh, if we didn't get to your question, uh, I will be collecting them from the Q&A in the chat, uh, and we'll see if we can answer uh, some more of those in the, in the next week or so. Um, yeah, big thank you to Laura and Rebecca and the climate mobilization. Uh, also wanted to uh, give a big thank you to Post Carbon Institute, uh, who partnered with us on this event and helped get the word out, probably brought many of you here. Uh, if you're not familiar with Post Carbon, uh, please visit their website at postcarbon.org. Uh, great place to learn more about uh, these issues that we're talking about here. Um, a few things in terms of follow-up. Uh, this recording is available, uh, will be available on Facebook immediately after we close here. Uh, so feel free to share that with anyone you think might be interested. Um, it will also be on the Transition US YouTube channel in a couple days uh, and will be emailed out uh, to all participants. Uh, so be on your lookout for that. Um, we do have some uh, hard costs that are associated with this free webinar series, and we want to uh, keep providing great content like this. Um, so if you are able to make a donation to support the work of Transition US, uh, if you appreciated this webinar, would like to see more like this, uh, please, um, go to transitionus.org uh, and click on our donate button uh, and make a small gift. I also just shared the link in the chat. Uh, and finally, uh, I will place in the chat a small uh, survey that you can take to let us know what kind of topics you're interested in uh, for future webinars, uh, how you thought this one went, uh, if there's anything that could be improved. Um, would really appreciate your input. Uh, I will also send that link out in the email uh, that I'll be sending in the next couple of days. Um, so thank you for taking your time, some time out of your day to uh, learn about this important topic. And uh, I think this is, this is just the beginning here. Um, so 
uh, please be in touch with us at Transition US if we can support in any way. And uh, I think I can speak for Laura and Rebecca to also say please be in touch with, with them if you'd like more support around declaring a climate emergency in your community. So thanks everybody. I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your day and uh, very happy new year. Great, thanks so much, Don. We appreciate this opportunity to connect with everyone so much. Yep, thank you all. And again, feel free to reach out with any questions. Um, we'll be sending out some resources in the next couple of days, as Don said. But, and thank you again to PCI and to Transition for hosting us. We have really enjoyed it. Yeah, thank Great. you so much. <laughs>